Welcome back students. This is Chemistry 1510 video notes and we are working on chapter 4 today, specifically oxidation reduction reactions. When we look at oxidation reduction reactions, this is a different class of reactions than we've seen before. These reactions end up transferring electrons between species. So there are several kinds or subclasses of redox reactions that we'll look at, but they all have the same general idea going on. That one species is losing uh, electrons, so oxidation occurs when something is losing electrons. And then reduction occurs when uh, something is gaining electrons. So, these two things have to always occur together because if they don't, we actually break the law of conservation of mass. So when we look at what an oxidation number is, it is just a chemist's way of keeping track of electrons. And here's the thing that's going to get real confusing. Sometimes oxidation numbers make sense, like in ionic compounds, where your ion's charge equals the oxidation number. In molecular compounds, um, these are compounds that don't have any charged species. So it's going to look really weird when we start putting oxidation numbers to them. So especially in this context, you have to remember that these numbers are essentially fake. What I mean by fake is they are not illustrating a charge. They are an accounting system that we use to keep track of the electrons. So, how are we going to make these separate in our brain or on paper from charges? The way that we're going to do that is oxidation numbers, when we write them, will have the, the positive or negative written first in front of the number, whereas charges are going to have the positive or negative charge written immediately following the number. And so you might now understand why when we were writing uh, ions in the past, I would try to write things as magnesium 2 plus so that I could illustrate that we were talking about a charge rather than an oxidation number. So in the grand scheme of life, don't freak out if this is really a struggle for you. It's not something that I'm going to um, pay super close attention to. So let's keep going and look at how to assign oxidation numbers. So here are some rules for assigning oxidation numbers. When we assign oxidation numbers, what needs to happen is you have to have these rules ingrained in your brain. So they are going to be something that you practice so much that you have them memorized by the time you take exam two. So let's look at the first one. Free elements in their natural state are going to have an oxidation number of zero. So what do free elements in their natural state look like? These are things on the periodic table that are listed um, or written in the chemical reaction just the way they're listed on the periodic table. So copper being a solid. Um, let's think helium, right, being a gas. Those are those elements' natural states. And then diatomics, right, are also natural states. Notice how bromine actually is a liquid. It's one of the two liquids on the periodic table. Then our next rule is monatomic ions have an oxidation number equal to the charge on the ion. So if we look at something like chloride ion, that has a minus one charge and it has, I'm sorry, a one minus charge and it has a minus one oxidation number. Something like uh, sulfide, something like sodium, their charges and their oxidation numbers are going to be the same. Then the uh, next couple examples here end up mostly pertaining to things that are molecular compounds. So when we see something that contains oxygen, pretend we see something like water, that oxygen is going to have a minus two oxidation number. Um, if we see something like Na2O, 
This one's really just two monatomic ions together, right? The sodium ion and the oxide ion. So we don't even really need this rule to tell us that oxygen is minus two. We know it because oxygen is always minus two when it's an ion. So of course there's exceptions to this, which is terrible, but it, it happens. Uh, peroxides are things where you have an oxygen-oxygen bond. One of the most common ones is hydrogen peroxide. So here oxygen would be a minus one. So hydrogen, on our next rule, has an oxidation number of one in most of its compounds. And when I say one, I mean plus one. So let's look at something like methane. In CH4, this would have a hydrogen that has an oxidation number of plus one. If we have something like sugar, C6H... 1206 that hydrogen has a plus one if we uh, change this to an ionic compound like this one then what we find is the sodium is a positive ion and the hydrogen is actually a negative ion in this case because this is an ionic compound with two monatomic ions coming together so this is also called a metal hydride and in this case, your hydrogen would have a minus one. So then let's uh, finish with our last one. The sum of all oxidation numbers in, uh, for the atoms, whether you're in a compound or a molecule, is going to have to equal what the overall charge is. So what I mean by that is if we look at, oh, let's do something straightforward. Um, one of your polyatomic ions, let's start with that. So if you have something like SO2, then the charge uh, between the sulfur, I'm sorry, I said charge, the oxidation number between the sulfur and the oxygen have to add up to the charge on the ion. If you have something like the CH4, notice how there's no charge written up here, right? That charge is zero, it's neutral. And so the oxidation numbers of carbon and hydrogen have to add up to zero. So let's do a couple of examples. So pH3 is first. So H always has a plus one oxidation number if it's not paired with a metal and phosphorus is not a metal. So now we can use rule five where there is no charge on pH3, which is called phosphine by the way, and so our phosphorus, we don't know what the oxidation number is on the phosphorus. We do know that we have three hydrogens, each at a plus one, and we know all of this has to equal a zero. So the oxidation number of phosphorus has to be a negative three to cancel out the plus three that you're getting from the hydrogens. So we used two rules in this one. We used uh, rule number four and rule number five. Let's do another example. So let's do the LiO2 next. For the LiO2, I see this as actually two monatomic ions because this is an ionic compound. And it's a binary ionic compound. So I know the charge on lithium is always an Li1 plus and oxygen is always a two minus. And so in this case, because we're talking about monatomic ions, our lithium has a plus one oxidation number and our oxygen has a minus two oxidation number because the charges equal uh, the oxidation number. Let's do one more. So the last one I want to do is this one, the uh, dichromate ion. So for the dichromate ion, we're going to use uh, two rules here. We're going to use the rule that first of all, oxygen is a negative two. And then we're going to use rule five again. So here, rule five says you have two chromiums and you have seven oxygens. And all of that has to equal the charge on the dichromate. And so it's kind of like a little mini algebra problem, and I know some of you are in love with algebra. So if we kind of uh, simplify this, what we find is that we have two chromium uh, plus a negative 14 has to equal, oops, sorry about that, has to equal a minus two. 
And so if we continue our little algebra problem, then we have uh, our chromium, where we added both sides, right? We added 14 to here and here. So we end up with a positive 12. And that positive 12 needs to be distributed between the two chromiums. So each chromium is going to be a positive 6. So there we go. Chromium's a plus 6. Oxygen's a minus 2. So I'll leave those last three for you to try, and we will continue working on this when we're in class. Thank you so much for your attention. This is Katoni signing out.